Um, anyway, I'm just I'm excited to uh, to be here for one last day with you guys. It's been an amazing week. We've covered a lot of ground, and uh, we're gonna try to land this plane today, if that's okay. We're gonna pray. Hey, I think some of the students might already be at Apple Valley. <laughs> that's, that's where they are, right? Getting that 5% uh, to suit image. Well, let's pray, and uh, we'll jump right in. God, we thank you so much for uh, just the week that you've given to us and, and just our ability to be able to connect with one another. And, uh, Father, ultimately to connect with, with your spirit and uh, what we believe he is doing in our lives and so, Spirit of God, just don't fail us now. Come into this place and speak to our hearts. Guide us, direct us. We love you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I just want to kind of recap on what we dealt with last night. And last night's subject was actually one of my favorite subjects to all you guys who weren't able to make it out. We dealt with the topic of secrecy secrecy. And we talked about how, um, uh, you know, Moses had sent forth these spies to spy out the, the land. He sent out 12 spies to spy out the land. And, you know, it's a very public event. They got leaders from every tribe or what have you, and, and they sent them out. It was this big ordeal, but the thing ended very badly. We know that, right? It ended very badly. Like, Ten of them came back with a negative report. Two of them, you know, uh, had a positive report. But by that time, the, the damage had been done. And, and we said that we couldn't imagine the conversation that actually surrounded the spies before. Before they even went out, you know, uh, when, when, when Moses had decided he was going to get them together, I'm pretty sure that people had their opinions formulated already. They knew that there were giants in the land. They knew that they, they, that, that, that they were afraid of those giants. And so I can imagine before the spies even went out um, that, that people had already begun to formulate stories or put fears in the hearts of the other people. And so when they, when they come back with this negative report, it had, it, it, the thing just did not end well for them. And so they had to spend time in the wilderness when they otherwise wouldn't have had to. And, and Joshua, he was part of, part of that mission. And so when it's time for him to lead now, we can imagine that he just had this totally, you know, different take on it. He's like, man, I'm not going to do it the way Moses did it. That didn't go too well. I'm going to do it the way I think it should be done. And so he sent two spies there were 12 at first. He sent two this time on this secret mission. You know, I just, you know, I just keep thinking about like James Bond or something. But anyway, he sends these two people on this secret mission to go out and, and, and spy out the land. And I, and I love it. I think that this idea of secrecy was, was uh, what made Joshua's, Joshua's efforts successful. And we talked about how, how sometimes it is, it, we have to watch who we tell things to. We have to watch who we tell things to. And, and sometimes it's better to just keep things to ourselves. And I'm going to read it because I think this is such an important, I mean, just life lesson overall, not just what, what, uh, with what God is doing for you, some big thing God may be doing. I just think it's a good life principle. Like when it comes to your business, when it comes to, you know, whatever, just to learn how to keep it to yourself sometimes. And so I'm going to read it. It says, be careful who you tell. Sometimes the less people we tell or the less we tell people, the better it is. The moment the wrong people have your information, it becomes subject to their contamination by uninvited and unwanted opinions. It is better to say nothing than to spend your time trying to play it down or explain it away. As your plans develop, choose carefully with who you share information. Initially, only involve people who see what you are seeing. Don't talk openly about things you are not ready to disclose. If you can do this, then when the right time to reveal the plans for crossing over, you will have already developed a strong immunity against negativity, criticism, and, and the unbelief of others. The bottom line is guard your heart. Be careful when you speak, who you speak to and what you say. Don't allow yourself to be hijacked by the opinions of others. 
I think we've all been there before where we've been hijacked by the opinions of others. We, we've told somebody something and they begin to say, oh, I don't really believe God is doing that or oh, I think that's not really. And so we kind of succumb to that and we begin to kind of downplay it like, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe I was just tripping that day, you know, whatever. Maybe I just got it twisted. I don't know. But, but you know, then we start like, oh, yeah, logically that doesn't even make sense. So maybe I won't do that. And, and, and so we, we began to kind of succumb to the opinions of others. And, and so sometimes we just have to learn how to keep things to ourselves. And as the plans of God develop in our lives, we can, we can begin to, to pray about whom he wants us to reveal these things to. And we can ask him to strategically put people in our lives that we can talk to about these things. Because you can't, you can't share something Thing with somebody who doesn't see the way you see, right? You can't, am I, am I, am I right on that? I mentioned last night, like, you know, that uh, sometimes, you know, have you ever told a guy, guy in here, have you ever told like one of your friends, some girl you like, and they start liking her? Like sometimes it benefits you just to kind of keep it to yourself, right? Or like somebody, somebody, you know, you tell somebody your plans for the future and they just begin to like, uh, you know, no, nah, that's not for you to do. And, and then they go and do it. Sometimes it just benefits you. So, so just as a life principle, I thought that was important to really kind of bring back up today. I think it's important for us to learn how to be quiet. I think there's freedom in being quiet sometimes and just keeping something secret for a little while until it is time to reveal it to somebody else. Now this morning, I actually kind of felt impressed to go in a little different direction than I was initially going to go. However, I want to touch on what I was going to deal with um, 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 this morning initially. And so you see how Joshua sends out these two spies to, into the land. And while the spies are there, they run into a harlot by the name of Rahab. And the Lord literally had kind of strategically placed Rahab in their path, and she begins to help them. And, and, and when you read the story, you're, you really look at it like, man, how does she, you want to know her story a little bit. You want to understand it. You're like, how does she become a prostitute? I mean, she seems so wise. She tells them, you know, like, wait here and, and go there and don't move for three days. They, they want, I mean, she seemed like she really knew what she was talking about. Right. And it's like, how did she become this prostitute? And, and she's like the most unlikely person that God uses to help them to, uh, cross over. She's like the most unlikely person God uses to. to and, and I just want to say today that that sometimes we're always looking for things to happen and we're waiting for things to happen from the top down. But God is like, he, he's like, no, there's some Rahabs, Rahabs who might not even be in your immediate community. I mean, she was not an Israelite, but she was there and, and she believed and she knew. She's like, man, I know that God has given us over to you. And I know, I heard about how, how he dried up the Red Sea so that y'all could walk over. Like, I know that y'all going to win this thing. And so I need you to remember me. I mean, the most unlikely person just kind of preaching back to them. Like, I know what he's doing, and I know that, he, that you guys are going to take this land. I mean, you would not even imagine running to a prostitute down the way, and they just speaking over your life. You see, sometimes God takes, takes the most unlikely people, and, and, and he begins to change things from the bottom up. And so you have to always keep your eyes open for what God is doing. I, I want, I'm going to tell this story. And um, ultimately, the story doesn't end well. However, there is this aspect of it that I think you guys can appreciate. Um, do you all remember the woman who was on death row uh, last year? Her name was Kelly Gissendainer in Georgia. Yeah, no, not one person. I thought, <laughs> I thought I'd get at least one person. Um, Kelly Gissendainer. Anyway, she was on death row in Georgia. She, had, she was the mastermind behind her husband's death. 
She's been, so she had kind of talked her boyfriend at the time into killing her husband. And she was put on death row because she wasn't, um, she didn't want to take like a deal. And so they put her on death row, even though the guy that actually murdered him, you know, got a lesser sentence. Anyway, so I remember I was, at, I was working at Berean at the time as associate pastor, and a letter comes across my desk. And it's this letter from the Georgia State Prison. I mean, random. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just on my desk, addressed to me. And so I open up the letter, and it's this young lady who is really good friends with Kelly. She cleaned this, the young lady who's actually writing the letter cleans up on death row. So she prov- cleans up Kelly's space. She provides Kelly with books. She provides Kelly with meals, different things like that. And so she's writing this letter to me and she's asking for me for Bible studies and different things like that. And then all of a sudden she's like, listen, we, I have this friend who is on death row. And what you don't know is that she has totally given her life to the Lord. Like she's totally giving her life to the Lord. And we are asking that you and your church please pray that the Lord do something to get her off of death row so that they will stay the execution. We really need you to pray. I mean, her her letter sounded so urgent. She was like, please, time is running out. I was like, mercy, that must, that, I mean, our prayer life should be like that, like just with urgency. She's like, time is running out. Please pray. And so sure enough, you know, I just let the, 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 the letter kind of sit on my desk for a little bit. And then all of a sudden, the, um, the, the, the news started reporting on it was time for Kelly Gissendainer to be executed. And it was on a Wednesday. I'll never forget. But it was that, that time where it was the year after we had that major ice storm. And so there was another supposed ice storm coming. And so that we wouldn't have the same results we had the year before, they shut everything down in the state of Georgia this year. And so they even stayed the execution right? This was on Wednesday. And the Holy Spirit began to speak to me. He was like, you know, I'm behind this. I want you to know because we didn't get one snowflake that day. Not one. He was like, I'm behind this and I need you to begin to pray. And so I did. I started looking up Kelly's story because I really wanted to know. And as, a, and, and, and as a result, I found out that while she was in prison, she had totally given her life to the Lord, got a theology degree, was ministering to like all the women in the, in the, in the jail, in the prison. And uh, I was like, oh man, she's like one of us. So I sent out the text message to like all the female pastors I know. I was like, listen, like we have to pray for her. Like she is one of us. Pray. I believe God is behind this. And, and sure enough, she was scheduled to be executed the next week. And I never forget driving my, my son to school and I'm, I'm crying and praying. And I was like, I was like, Lord, if not for any other reason, I need you to do this for me. We're talking about Rahab and, and God really like just giving you favor in the eyes of the, the most unlikely person, right? And I'm like, God, if for nothing else, I need you to do this for me in my own faith journey. I need you to stay that execution. But while I'm praying, what, what I later found out was thousands of clergymen and, and people had come together and they had begun to pray for, for Kelly. And I mean, she's literally bringing the community together for the cause of Christ. And they had had this huge like um, 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 vigil outside of Emory University on her behalf. People just talking about God and and doing things for God. And and she's just bringing everything, everybody together for the cause of Christ. And and sure enough, you know, we're staying up. Everybody's looking at every media outlet possible. and, and, And we never saw where they executed her. And like the next morning, they say that, not, that, that when they tested the drug initially that they were going to inject her with, when they tested the drug initially, it was fine. When it came time to inject her, the drug was cloudy. Now, I, I don't know about you guys, but I don't know how a drug goes from being fine to being cloudy in a matter of minutes. 
It's all right. I have church by myself. So God, so like, so so she, so she, the drug goes from being being fine to cloudy in a matter of minutes. And so it, we 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 start seeing on media outlets that they state the execution, and then they begin to question whether the state of Georgia could even even like uh, you know perform constitutional executions anyway. So for that that for for a time period, all executions in the state of Georgia were stayed. And so they began, I mean, we were just like, man, God has done something so miraculous and so amazing. And I have no idea what his bigger plan is, but all I know, or was, or what he was doing, but all I know is that Kelly was a Rahab. And she pulled all of us together, I mean, and she began to change our community. It was just this big ordeal. The most likely person, a woman sitting on death row, changing the community. And we always have to keep our eyes open for what it is God may be doing and who it is God may be wanting to use in your life. In your life, don't discredit the, the, the prostitute or the homeless person or the drunk person. Don't discredit the person that doesn't look like you or doesn't have as much money as, as you have. God wants to do something, and more than likely, he's doing it from the bottom up, not from the top down. Now, I just want to read something to you guys. For the children of Israel, crossing the Jordan was the pivotal moment in their journey from slavery in Egypt to freedom in Canaan. Crossing over, crossing this Jordan was the pivotal mo moment. And let me just pause here because uh, it, is, it is important for us to know, it's imperative for us to know that there is no limbo. You're either going to go forward or you're going to die. You're either going to go forward or you're going to stay in the, in, the, in the wilderness. There is no in-between. And for them, this crossing over was the pivotal moment of their journey. It was a moment that required a particular kind of leadership. Hear me closely now. We said before that God doesn't just want Christians. He wants Christian leaders that he can flood the earth with. He re it required a particular kind of leadership, a Joshua leadership. The name Joshua means savior, a name that is not without significance when we understand the true nature of crossing over and the life or death implications of our lives. Moses style leadership can get you out of Egypt, but you are going to need a Joshua to get you into your Canaan. Are you with me? Joshua was a warrior, a soldier. He led Israel in all their wars and was built for a fight. Joshua leadership is breakthrough in nature. It is conquering and possessing. Joshua leadership is breakthrough in nature. It is conquering and possessing. It is leadership that delivers and saves. Somewhere at the forefront of every barrier breaking business team or initiative or initiative at Andrews University, there is a Joshua leader. They are built for the kill and born to dismantle the status quo. They are born to dismantle the status quo that resist their future. There is something that is hindering you from moving forward and you were born to dismantle it. Sadly, this kind of leadership appears to be lacking. Too many of us are comfortable with being stuck where we are. And there we will stay unless a Joshua steps up to lead us. God is calling us to be a Joshua generation. He is calling us to dismantle the status quo, to not be comfortable with the way things are, the way things have been, to not be comfortable with mediocrity. Stop being okay with mediocrity, just getting up and going, and if I get a C, I'm okay. 
I mean, you were born for something so much more than that. And what you were born for is breakthrough in nature. You were built for the kill. You were built to possess the Canaan land, not to just see it from afar off. You were built to, to, to go in and, 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 and have everything God has promised for you. Stop settling for, for, the, for the scraps. You were built to possess. And so God is calling us you guys, to really now step up and do what it is he has called us to do, to cross over. I'm going to tell you that this moment, like, like you guys think that you just come here to, to hear my words, but I think some of you know that the Holy Spirit has been talking to, to you and he's asking you to cross over. He's asking you to cross over. He's asking you to be a Joshua kind of leader. I mean, one that delivers and saves. And so I just want to make an appeal today just to kind of prepare for this evening. Those of you who really believe God is calling you to be a Joshua leader, I want to, I want to pray for you. I have three minutes, and so don't make me beg. I need you to come on, on down here. You believe that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you, and he is calling you to be this Joshua leader. I'm going to invite you to come down here. Just meet me at the front so that we can pray together. He's calling you. He's been speaking to you, and you you know it beyond a shadow of a doubt. Hey, it's going to take courage. Go ahead and stand up. Take, we, we spoke about courage. It's going to take some. Just go ahead and come on down here. There's somebody else. I have two, two minutes and I have to pray. So, yeah, thank you. Is somebody else? Hey, we don't want to stay where we are. And ha you guys, you are looking at young people who are going to dismantle, going to dismantle the kingdom of the enemy, going to dismantle the status quo, going to dismantle everything that hinders their future. You are looking at them right now, and I'm proud to be in your presence. And I'm going to ask God to really just begin to, to show you exactly what it is he would have you to do. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for raising up these here. These who, whom you have called to be leaders. We, we know that you've already identified. You identified them a long time ago. Now they're just being obedient to the call. So, Lord, I'm praying that you will put a level of courage in them that, like, will shock everybody that they meet. People will look at them and say, man, when did you become so bold? When did you become so confident? And they will be able to say, God has called me to something greater. He has called me to possess the land. No matter who inhabits, no matter what giant threatens me, or no matter what, what thing, what big old river stands in my way. So, God, I am asking for the power of your spirit over the lives here of all those who are standing here. Pour out your spirit in a way that you never have before. And I pray, God, that you will just lighten their path and, and just illuminate it, Lord. Allow them to know exactly how you are leading, what you are doing, where you are sending them, what it is you want them to do while they're here at Andrews, whom they can talk to. God, send them Rahabs and send them grassroots stuff and, and do whatever needs to be done so that they can just begin tearing down walls and, and barriers and, and things that hinder the people of the living God. And so, Father, we are believing you for their lives. I mean, I, 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 and I'm, I'm one of those, and I believe that there are stu some students out in the audience that when, they, when we begin to see their courage, that we will follow. We will follow God, and an amazing movement will begin. It will start right here at Andrews. And they'll be able to say, man, it's because we heard the Spirit of God tell us, I have something for you. I need you just to cross over and get it. 
Father, we thank you. We believe you. We love you. And I'm just longing for the day. I can't wait for the day that we can stand back and we can see all the victories that have been won as a result of this stand that has been taken today. And we can say, man, God did it. And it's marvelous in our eyes. We love you so much and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.